This is a University of Otago podcast. Good evening and welcome to this very auspicious occasion. Um, my name is Harleen Hain and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research and Enterprise. And on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor, um, Professor David Skegg, I would like to call on Associate Professor Sue Court, who is the Acting Pro-Vice-Chancellor of Humanities, to introduce our very distinguished speaker. Good evening. Andrew Bradstock has been appointed as the Howard Patterson Professor of Theology and Public Issues, which is a new post established under the Leading Thinkers Initiative, for which his main responsibility is to establish and direct a centre for theology and public issues with the aim of contributing to debate or current issues from a theological perspective. This is the first such centre in New Zealand, although there are several others across the world, for example, in the USA, in Australia, the UK, and South Africa. So we are very excited to have Professor Bradstock in this position at Otago. Andrew and his wife Helen came from the UK to take up this new post in January 2009. However, he is no stranger to this part of the world as he had held a postdoctoral fellowship in church history here in 1990-1991 when he was living at uh, Knox College. Prior to coming to Otago, Andrew was co-director of the Centre for Faith and Society at the Von Hergel Institute at Cambridge, where he co-authored a path-breaking and influential report into the Church of England and welfare provision. Previously, he spent several years working ecumenically to enable the church's voice to be heard on public issues, and he has also been heavily involved in facilitating dialogue between churches and politicians at Westminster. His research interests include exploration of how faith and politics relate in both contemporary and historical contexts, and his latest book, completed just a few weeks ago and due out in December, is a study of radical religious and political movements in Cromwell's England. Professor Bradstock is tonight going to discuss what public theology is and what it is not, and the challenges involved in a secular context like New Zealand. He will offer some thoughts on how we can have a more effective public discussion of such issues. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Professor Andrew Bradstock and welcome him to the Humanities Division of Otago University. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Acting Pro-Vice-Chancellor, Honoured guests, friends, colleagues, good to see so many here. Thanks for taking an hour of your life to come and uh, spend it with us this evening. And thank you for all your support. Um, can I just do a couple of quick things before starting the lecture? Um, firstly, I'd just like to make one or two thank yous. Uh, this is not going to sound like an Oscar speech. Um, one of the most butter-clenching events possible, I think. Um, but I do, would just like to take this opportunity to say thank you to a few people. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank my wife, Helen. Uh, I'm not going to mention all the reasons I want to thank her, except perhaps the main one is uh, agreeing to join me on this adventure, um, particularly leaving behind family and uh, two adult children back in the UK. And um, I'm constantly reminded if it wasn't for Skype, we probably wouldn't be here. Um, I'd also like to thank Murray, Ray and Paul Trebilco, who have been the two heads of department under whom I've served here so far, and I'd also like to thank all my colleagues in the Department of Theology and Religion, Mary, Sandra, Annette, Lynn, and her husband Dave, James, Tim, Erica, Will, Greg, and before he left, Ivor, particularly for making me feel welcome and very much part of the department here. I'd also like to thank other colleagues and friends that I've made around the university since being here. There's far too many to mention, but I would just like to single out two or three. I would like to thank particularly the Reverend Greg Hewson, the chaplain of the university, who's shown me enormous friendship 
and support in so many practical and indeed spiritual ways since we've been here. And also two colleagues who started the same week as I did, Professor Kevin Clements and Professor Liam McIlvenny, whose friendship and collegiality I've also much appreciated. Also, thanks for those who sent messages of support for tonight. I uh, particularly appreciate those. also like to um, thank the friends that we've made at Knox Church, who've also made us feel very welcome since we've been here in Dunedin. Again, far too many to mention, um, but I would just like to special mention uh, to John Elder and Janet Sim Elder, who've become particular friends of ours, and Sarah Mitchell and Rod Mitchell. And I'm sorry to exclude others from this, but you know who you are. Um, just also like to mention um, half a dozen people who've played a particularly significant role in shaping my thinking over the years and indeed steering me in certain directions during my career. I just want to mention my mentor at Bristol University when I was an undergraduate, Dennis Turner, now in a very distinguished position at Yale University, who really did set the rudder for much of my research. Uh, Professor David McClellan at the University of Kent, who was my PhD supervisor. Uh, Peter Matheson, uh, who I came to work with here back in 1990, doing the postdoctoral fellowship that Sue mentioned. I'm going to mention Peter again in a minute, um, just to warn him. Um, I'd like to mention Andre Heaton and Professor Mary Gray, who were two colleagues of mine at LaSant Union College in Southampton, and also Professor Chris Rowland at Oxford University, with whom I've collaborated and who's been also a great friend and inspiration. And finally, I just want to mention some people of whom it would definitely be true to say that without them, I would not be here. Firstly, I want to mention the Patterson family. Obviously, I will never know Howard Patterson, but from what I've heard about him from people who did know him, I feel very proud to hold a position that bears his name. And it has been good to meet his widow, Lee, his brothers, Greg and Grant, and his mother, June, some of whom I see here tonight. And I would like to thank them publicly for their support and indeed for their interest in the work that I've been doing, which really is ongoing support. I'm going to mention uh, something else that they're involved in a bit later on. I'd also like to thank Ian and Annette Tullock also for their enormous generosity in helping to make this position possible. It's been a pleasure to meet both of them and talk over and share some of my ideas with them. And also, last but not least, I'd like to thank the Presbyterian Synod of Otago and Southland, who've also put a considerable amount of support into this position. And it's been good to meet the Chief Executive, Fergus Syme. So I would just like to pay tribute to all those and um, thank them for, for all that they've done to make this work possible and the vision uh, that they've had behind putting this job into actuality. The second thing I just want to do before I start is um, mention that uh, an event next week, well, it's an event that you can make happen if you want. Um, it's, a, it's a tradition with these lectures that there are no questions and discussion afterwards, which I think is rather a shame, really, particularly if, like me, you're hoping that you're going to wind people up a bit. Um, so what I've done is I've booked seminar room 4C11 in the arts building, uh, the usual seminar room just along the corridor from the Theology and Religion Department, at 12.30 on Tuesday next week, Tuesday the 8th of June at 12.30 for an hour or so. Uh, if you want to follow up any of the things that I've been saying this evening, uh, do please come along, because I would really like to engage in conversation around some of the issues that I want to raise. So that's Tuesday next week at uh, 12.30. Well, it is, of course, a great honour to be standing here, and one which I have in no sense come to terms with. In fact, when I look back over my career since I left school under a cloud at the age of 16. This is hardly the outcome I would have imagined. And when I think of my teachers and the others who knew me in my teens and 20s, their faces would simply have glazed over in disbelief had they been told that one day I would hold a chair in the most prestigious university in a major Commonwealth country. That's just to get you in a good mood. <laughs> My um, route to this point has hardly been that of a conventional academic. 30 years ago, at the age of 25, I was just completing my ninth year in a dead-end job in a small government office. And although by that point I had begun to sense that there might be more to life than 40 years as a civil servant, followed by an index-linked pension, I had little expectation of building a radically new career. 
even when I negotiated my way into Bristol University the following year, something I had to do on account of my unorthodox qualifications. There was no vocational intent behind my choice of subjects. I simply opted for two that I had a passion for, theology and politics. It was while at Bristol, however, that I conceived the idea of an academic career. And I count myself fortunate to have been able to spend a further few years after graduating laying the foundations for that. And included in that process, as Sue has mentioned, was a period here in Dunedin in the early 1990s when, having written a thesis under David McClellan comparing the 17th century diggers with 20th century priests inspired by liberation theology, I took up a postdoctoral fellowship in church history with Peter Matheson to do some work on Thomas Munzer. It did not seem in the least strange either to Peter or to me that someone should come from England to New Zealand to work with a Scotsman on a German reformer, <laughs> and nor does it now. In order to impose some discipline on my studies, I enrolled for a Master of Theology by dissertation and submitted my research for that degree, and I'm very proud to have a degree from Otago University. One of the things that made my first stay in Dunedin so enjoyable was living at Knox College under the mastership of the Reverend Peter Marshall, and it's been good to renew acquaintance with Peter and many other friends from that time. Through being part of the community at Knox, I came to understand a little about the New Zealand worldview, about what matters here and what doesn't. In particular, how few things matter more than sport and how beating Australia, any form of it, matters more than anything. Humour, of course, is a major part of this, and I've often dined out on one particular incident which took place at Knox during my stay there. In anticipation of a visit to Australia, I had acquired the necessary visa form for a UK citizen, and a few friends gathered round the dining table to help me fill it out. All was going smoothly, until I reached the question which read, have you ever been convicted of a criminal offence? And as my pen hovered over the no box, one of my helpful advisors said, of course, you know what you should really put in there? No, I said. And as one person, the group responded, oh, hell, is that still a requirement? <laughs> if I have one regret about this evening, it's that neither of my parents has lived to share it. I sometimes wonder what they would have made of all this. Not just because I gave them so much heartache during my time at school, but because my mother in particular, coming from a family with no history of post-compulsory education, was firmly of the view that going to university was the kind of thing other people did, not us. I remember well her discomfort when my sister began a teacher training course a few years before I enrolled at Bristol. And her attitude, I think, is encapsulated perhaps in a remark she made when told a few years later that I was to be awarded an MA. I used to think you had to be really clever to get one of those. <laughs> if one of the reasons I put myself in the frame for this job was the fond memories I had of Dunedin, the overriding factor was the challenge of the job itself and the rare opportunity that it offered me to draw on the different experiences I've had over the last 25 years or so. One of those has been exploring through research and teaching the history and theory of the relationship between faith and public life. And this has led me both back to mainstream and marginal figures in Christian history, as well as to South Africa emerging from apartheid and Nicaragua under a revolution inspired by a liberation theology reading of scripture. But I've also had considerable hands-on experience, particularly during my five years with the United Reformed Church, of seeking to articulate the concerns of the church in the public square and of working at Westminster to develop conversations between politicians and church people. And I do not underestimate the value of this extra academic work, this engagement in the arena where the rubber of faith actually hits the road of politics. Because what this post that I'm in now demands of its holder is not that they spend all their time writing learned theoretical papers about what public theology might be, but actually doing it. And in case Murray and Paul are looking worried, I will spend some of my time writing papers. <laughs> I do have the letters PBRF engraved on my heart, like everybody else in the division, 
but, but not all of my time. It's still early days, of course, uh, but I believe some useful groundwork has been done. Over the last 16 months, I've written and taught some new courses. I've given lectures, talks, and sermons across the two islands, initiated a number of research projects, begun to attract postgraduate and postdoctoral students, and hosted a series of conversations with public figures and create space for a, a, a type of discourse not found elsewhere. Can I thank you if you've been able to support any of these ventures? It's been heartening to see good numbers attending our public events and interest in them and the centre growing. And if you aren't yet on the mailing list to receive news of events hosted by the centre, please email me at the address on this card, which you may have picked up on the way in and you can pick up on the way out. This is not the place, of course, for a summary of the past year's activities, nor a preview of the centre's future plans. What I would say in terms of the, the last year is that I valued immensely the opportunity to meet so many people and organisations doing public theology in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and in conversation with them, begin to ascertain the most appropriate and effective role for a centre, situated some distance from the seat of power and within an academic rather than an ecclesiastical structure. In terms of the future, it's good to report that a number of plans are beginning to assume a concrete form. In partnership with a sister think tank in the UK, we're developing a resource to feed into the forthcoming debate around MMP, and with others in Dunedin putting together an event to explore the question, what makes a good city? This ought to prove particularly interesting, given the issues with which Dunedin is currently grappling and with local body elections on the horizon. We're also planning some values-based training for young leaders, a project in the area of prisoner rehabilitation, an event looking at hymns and social justice with a well-known Dunedin hymn writer, and a couple of events involving dialogue with members of other faiths. Finally, I'm proud to announce this evening that thanks to the generosity of the Patterson Charitable Trust, the first Howard Patterson Memorial Lecture will be held later this year and will be given by one of the best-known and most effective public theologians around at the moment, Jim Wallace, founder and CEO of the Sojourners Community in Washington, D.C., and a member of President Obama's Inner Circle of Faith Advisors. This meeting with Jim will be on Tuesday, the 28th of September, and a whole afternoon of events is lined up, so do please make a note of that in your diary. Now, I guess I need to do something that an engineer or an architect or a historian in this position might not need to do, and that is explain what my discipline is. Theology, period, we might understand as the study of the nature of God and religious truth. And unless we're followers of Richard Dawkins, we might recognise it as a mainstream academic discipline. But what does it mean to talk of public theology? Answering that is not quite as straightforward as one might wish, for while the term public theology has only been in use for about three decades, it's already attracted a number of definitions and been used in a variety of different ways, sometimes even in contexts where its use has not been explained. As leading US public theologian Harold Breitenberg writes in an essay published only last month, part of the problem lies in the fact that the term public theology can be used, quote, to refer to a body of literature, a form of discourse, a way of doing theology and ethics, a tradition within the Christian church, and a field of study. However, Breitenberg does also note that, quote, most conceptions of public theology overlap in various and significant ways, such that it is possible to fashion a consensus understanding and definition of it that is marked by several key features. So let me outline briefly what I see as those key features. Let's start with a good working definition. Public theology involves inputting constructively to contemporary discourse in the public square, drawing upon the insights of the faith which it offers as gift to the secular world. Public theology involves inputting constructively to contemporary discourse in the public square, drawing upon the insights of the faith which it offers as gift to the secular world. I think this captures its essence pretty well, but let me expand on it a little. First, what do we mean by the term public square? 
Traditionally, this might have been a physical public space where people gathered to discuss the issues of the day, the agora, perhaps, of the Greek city-state. Today, we conceive of this square rather more abstractly, perhaps using something like the definition Charles Taylor employs in his magnificent book, A Secular Age, of, quote, a common space in which the members of society are deemed to meet through a variety of media, print, electronic, and also face-to-face -face encounters. So, Taylor suggests, our public square today is the world of newspapers, TV, radio, and increasingly the internet, the blogosphere, the Twitter-drome, whatever. Um, though Taylor stresses, we can still talk of a common sphere in the singular. Quote, because although the media are multiple, as well as the exchanges which take place in them, they are deemed to be, in principle, intercommunicating. Taylor goes on to say, the discussion we're having on television now takes account of what was said in the newspaper this morning, which in turn reports on the radio debate yesterday, and so on. Now, Taylor, of course, betrays the culture out of which he is writing. And I have to say that the public square here in New Zealand seems rather more confined than in countries like the USA and my own. Coming from the UK, I cannot help but observe how, for example, the absence of a choice of daily or Sunday newspaper seriously limits the space for public debate, notwithstanding the very high standard of comment and analysis offered by our own ODT. As does, perhaps even more seriously, the virtual absence on free-to-air TV of programmes devoted to serious discussion of current affairs. Such news programmes as are available on these channels seem to want to entertain often more than enlighten and to work on an assumption that viewers are incapable of absorbing anything longer than a 10-second soundbite. In marked contrast, I have to say, to the fare provided by national radio. I do think there are serious questions to ask about the reduced space for debate in this country and the apparent lack of appetite for any debate and the consequence of this for the effective functioning of democracy. As has been suggested to me, there is much that the popular media could learn from the model of the Marai in terms of facilitating genuine and constructive discussion. Second, what does it mean to talk about drawing upon the insights of the faith to contribute constructively to public theology, uh, to, to public discourse? Here we get to the nub of what it means to do public theology. What resources do we have? What authority do we accord these resources? And how are they to be used? I would want to argue that an authentic Christian public theology will be informed by both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, recognising both as disclosing information about the nature of God and the nature of God's dealings with and purposes for humanity. Public theology will be informed by many other sources as well. It can hardly contribute effectively in the public square without drawing upon the insights of other disciplines, for example. And it goes without saying that it will use the wealth of social teaching in both the Catholic and Protestant traditions. But the character of its work, the principles upon which it is predicated, must emerge from an honest and open engagement with the texts upon which the Christian faith is grounded. Any other approach, it seems to me, leaves us making it up as we go along. And while such a process will also lead to creative and constructive contributions to the public square, it cannot qualify as theology. But this whole area is hugely problematic. How, we might ask, can writings emanating from disparate communities scattered around the Middle and Near East over a period of several centuries have anything relevant to say to 21st century New Zealand? or indeed the wider global community? And why should it be thought necessary that they should? In contrast to those confessional positions which understand texts contained in scripture to be normative for human conduct and binding on society today, public theology rejects the Christendom approach which looks for an imposition of Judeo-Christian values from the top down. Quite the reverse, in fact, as my earlier use of the word gift in relation to the insights of the faith suggests. Public theology does derive from scripture a sense of the value God is perceived to place on human life. 
an understanding that God has, as liberation theologians used to call it, a preferential option for the poor, an appreciation of how a creation perspective can deepen respect for the ecosystem. And it will want these insights to inform public discourse, contribute to the creation of just and peaceful communities, and increase the potential for human flourishing. But it will offer them as one contribution alongside others, recognising that the days when theology was the only voice in the public domain are well and truly past. If theology is heard today, it must be solely on account of the merit of what it has to say. So public theology will not be afraid to engage with the Bible, recognising that the God to be encountered there is inherently public in character, acting decisively in human history and even identifying with it by taking human flesh. It will argue that a doctrine such as the Trinity has inescapably social implications, both in the sense that God in becoming human offers a model of social engagement and incarnation, and that God in God's self is characterised by community, dialogue and interaction. To develop for a moment the theme of incarnation, the Gospel accounts of the ministry of Jesus form an important resource for public theology, offering suggestive insights into how it might shape its praxis. From the outset, Jesus makes plain his intent to bring good news to the poor, the imprisoned and the oppressed, and then fleshes this out as he challenges individuals about their priorities with respect to money and possessions, embraces and heals those ignored and disdained by respectable society, affirms the peacemaker, the merciful and the meek, attacks the extortioner and the profiteer, challenges selfishness and corruption in high places, and announces and anticipates the coming of the kingdom by offering an alternative model for social relationships grounded in love. The Hebrew scriptures which informed Jesus' ministry highlight similar themes of relevance to public theology. In Genesis, for example, God is depicted as the author of life, the creator of all people in the one image, with an equality of status and dignity who are mandated to steward and tend the earth. In the Exodus narrative, God is the liberator from captivity and slavery, the one who promises abundant life, symbolised by a surfeit of milk and honey, in place of exploitation and death. In the provision of manna, or daily bread in the wilderness, God is seen to be fostering among the people a spirit of gratitude for the enough of God's bounty, curbing the tendency to seek private gain at the expense of others. In instituting the Sabbath, the Jubilee, and days of fasting, boundaries are placed upon material consumption and the exploitation of the earth, preventing an entrenchment of social inequality and ensuring that those temporarily pushed to the margins are drawn back into the community rather than made permanently dependent upon its charity. And in recounting how God periodically raises up prophets to speak truth to power, the biblical writers emphasise the duty of governments to rule in the public interest, to ensure that justice is practised, and to hear the cause of the poor and needy. Even in these brief references, we can discern principles with potentially wider applicability than their original context. Narratives which can prompt us to ask uncomfortable questions about, for example, our attitude to the planet and the created order about the purpose of our market activity and the interests that our economy might be thought to serve, about the value we place on human life and criteria we employ when according respect, worth and status, questions about what makes for human well-being and flourishing and whether this is to be measured solely in terms of material wealth, and about the core values upon which we build our lives, our communities and our nation. And it's because asking these questions is vital for the health and well-being of a community, and because these questions surface all too infrequently in the public square, that public theology has the temerity to describe its contribution to that space as both constructive and gift. It is not that theology's contribution is always distinctive or different or even original, but because it seeks to further not its own interests, but in the prophet Jeremiah's words, the welfare of the city, it may be better disposed to ask the difficult and the disturbing question than many others. At the heart of public theology is a conviction that the insights it can offer are relevant to all humanity, and on that basis it offers them 
in a spirit of generosity. Two examples may exemplify this depiction of public theology as gift. First, the truth and reconciliation process established under Desmond Tutu in South Africa after apartheid, which sought to enable that country to move on from its past, not by trying to forget that past or paper over the deep divisions that were its legacy, nor by indulging in recrimination, none of which could have laid the foundations for a peaceful and stable future, but by seeking to concretize the gospel categories of forgiveness, reconciliation and restoration, to make available the possibility of new start, reflecting the model which Jesus himself practiced and promoted. And second example, the drafting and promulgation by church leaders in the United States in the months leading up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq of a workable alternative strategy to invasion, one which, while taking account of the need to remove the tyrannical and hated regime, argued that this could be achieved without the death, destruction and destabilisation which followed the Bush and Blair-led invasion, and which urged that the longer-term and wider geopolitical issues of that region also be addressed. Had this plan been adopted as it very nearly was, how different might the situation in that region be today? So the point of the rather silly title for this lecture will now, I hope, be clear. What other type of theology is there than a public kind? Is it possible to read the biblical texts other than as inherently public in their focus? Is public theology, despite its apparent newness as a discipline, simply what theology has been about from the start? Now, there's a degree of hyperbole in this, of course, for theology announces also the possibility of transformation at the individual as well as societal level and places much emphasis on the work of the cross in reconciling sinful men and women with a loving and forgiving God. But public theology does seek to expose the impossibility of defining faith as simply a private matter, something which both Christians and atheists can, for different reasons, have a tendency to do. And as Marion Maddox, until recently at Victoria University, points out, in one sense, public theology arose as a reaction to the privatisation of faith that had become so much a feature of late 20th century religious practice. Jim Wallace, I think, gets the balance right when he defines faith as always personal, but never private. This is not the place for a detailed critique of private religion but it's almost exclusive focus on rescuing souls for heaven, and it's the focus itself that worries me more than the actual activity, can promote a profound indifference to the affairs of this world, a tendency which I believe renders it highly unorthodox. It is not just that it plays down the public consequences of a faith position. How, one might ask, can one love one's neighbour in today's global village without asking questions about the rules of global trade, the status of refugees, or the impact of global warming. It overlooks, it seems to me, the fact that the God we encounter in Scripture seems less passionate about religious activities like worship, asking only that it be rooted in the practice of justice, than what goes on in the hurly-burly of everyday life, where the hungry need to be fed and those at enmity reconciled. Private theology's implicit assumption that there are, as it were, two histories in progress, one in which souls are being rescued for a far-off heaven, the history that God is really interested in, and the mundane world of terrorist attacks and economic downturns and famines and unemployment and rising sea levels and nuclear holocausts, seems to fly in the face of orthodox belief that it is into that mundane history that God became incarnate. Neither scripture nor the creeds of the church suggest that it is our destiny to live forever in the world beyond, as an alternative, I suppose, to the even worse fate of being left behind. Since it is this world that is waiting with eager longing to be set free from its bondage to decay, as St Paul says it, put it, puts it, it is here on this earth that we pray for the kingdom to come and God's will to be done as in heaven. And it's from this world that, according to the writer of Revelation, God will fashion a new heaven and a new earth. And that's why the resurrection, which still lies at the heart of the church's creeds, is so central to public theology. 
Whatever actually happened on that first Easter Sunday, and without there having been, as Bishop Tom Wright puts it, an event that actually occurred in some sense in time and space, Christianity makes no sense, either as a phenomenon or a praxis. The resurrection speaks of the eruption into history of the kingdom, of the future momentarily into the present. If, as Wright says, we understand the resurrection as, quote, only what we call a spiritual event, either involving Jesus being alive now in some heavenly realm or simply involving a new sense of faith and hope in our minds and hearts, the only events that will follow are various forms of private spirituality. But what in fact the writers of the Gospels and Acts present is a challenge to concretize now the radical themes of peace, justice and inclusion that are at the heart of the kingdom, to do, in other words, some serious public theology. All of which leads us back to what you might think is the elephant in the living room this evening, namely how to make sense today of the resources upon which public theology wants to draw. As I have already hinted, public theology does not suggest that systems of government or economic principles drawn from the practice of ancient nomadic communities can be applied without reserve today. It does not suggest that quoting Bible verses in itself will cut any ice in public debate or carry any weight with opinion formers or policymakers. But as I have also hinted, it does believe that serious engagement with these texts and a commitment to relate them to our specific context can provoke penetrating and incisive questions, challenge accepted norms, and nudge contemporary debates in unexpected and creative directions. Believing that they address human and social concerns common to all periods of history, public theology can draw out principles and insights from these texts, which it will seek to feed into public debate. So, for example, with respect to the global economic crisis, a topic on which I've been invited to write and speak a good deal in the past 12 months, we could say with US theologian Walter Brueggemann that while the specifics of the current market collapse are peculiarly modern, biblical perspectives are pertinent because the fundamental issues of economics are constant from ancient to contemporary times. Constants, he says, such as credit and debt, loans and interest, and the endless tension between the haves and the have-nots. And this would apply, I would argue, with respect to issues across the board, from the privatisation of prisons to foreshore and seabed legislation, from carbon emissions trading to last month's budget. And also with respect to global issues, like, for example, the war on terror and the work of our provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan, Public theologians in the United States, like Jim Wallace, are currently urging their president to place more emphasis on development rather than combat in tackling terrorism in Afghanistan, highlighting in the process the prophet Micah's assertion that it is only when people are able to sit under their own vines and under their own fig tree, only when they have a stake in their society such that none can make them afraid, that they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. In fact, there are really two elephants in the lecture theatre tonight, and the other relates to the final part of the definition of public theology I offered earlier. Even allowing that it is possible to offer, as a gift to the secular world, insights drawing on the resources of the faith, what grounds are there for thinking that the secular world will listen? How can public theology get a hearing in a self-consciously secular society like New Zealand. There is, I think, some confusion about what secular means. And as Rowan Williams helpfully points out, secularism comes in two guises. One, which seeks to exclude and privatise religious faith as much as possible, which he labels programmatic secularism. And another, which he calls procedural secularism, which seeks to allow all faith perspectives and none equal access to the public realm, but to confer no privilege on any. This latter type of secularism, of course, has its roots in the Judeo-Christian tradition, which by asserting that only God was sovereign, challenged the pretense of a Caesar or a Pharaoh to be the source of ultimate truth. 
But even if, if in this post-Cold War period, procedural secularism is what we find in most contemporary societies, including our own, there is still a widespread view that religious language has no place in the public arena, that public discourse, to be truly public, must employ language, principles and reasoning which are intelligible to any reasonable person and based on public canons of validity. So, for example, a term like sanctity of life must be ruled out of court because it embraces the concept of holiness, which can only be conferred upon something by God. And it's equally unacceptable to speak of the equal value of all people in terms of their having been created in the image of God. Those familiar with the work of Rawls and Beghini and Aldi and others will know the nuances of this debate. But the argument broadly goes that unless religious speakers recognise the need for a common language to exist in the public square, they treat their hearers with a degree of disrespect and exclude them from the conversation. They treat others as less than equal if they do not adopt the language of common discourse. And that severely limits the scope for the kind of contribution I've been arguing this evening that public theology wants to make. In brackets, it's worth noting if religious people feel aggrieved that this supposed need to disintegrate their beliefs and language, uh, if they feel aggrieved at this supposed need to disintegrate their beliefs and language, that exactly the same thing happens in reverse in the USA, where no person serious about holding political office dare leave God language out of their speeches, whether or not it reflects their personal beliefs. <coughs> Having said all this, there are signs more recently of a shift in the tone of this debate. Not least, as against all expectations, religion has burst back onto the scene and been perceived as having something useful to contribute to debates. As the title of the new book by John Micklethwaite and Adrian Wardridge, which was discussed on Kim Hill a couple of weeks ago, has it, God is back. And what they, these authors call the global revival of faith, which stretches from Africa to Latin America to perhaps most surprisingly of all China, can no longer be ignored. Not every aspect of this so-called revival of faith is, of course, positive. But it is increasingly hard to ignore the challenge this variety of religious voices present as they reverberate around the contemporary public square. Paul Vallely, sometime advisor to Bob Geldof, has concluded that the key question today is whether we can create, quote, something positive and healthy from this crucible, or whether we are sleepwalking into an age of confrontation and blind defensiveness. We do need to do something more than contain or translate that which we fear and do not understand, Vallely writes. We need to find a balance which maintains the secularist separation of church and state, but which allows the thinking and acting of religions to play a part in shaping the post-atheist culture which is forming all around us. It is the search for a new political language, and it is a massive and vital task. I suggest we need to recognise the limitations of the requirement that religious people translate what they have to say into some supposed common language. And there are, of course, questions about who determines what this common language is. If all voices should be treated with equal respect in the public square, so too should all forms of reasoning. Another weakness of the demand that all public voices adopt a common language is that it tends to close down rather than open up genuine debate. Surely there is much to be gained by allowing all voices to speak with integrity and candour, by allowing, for example, the full richness of a term like sanctity of life to deepen ethical debates rather than insist that it be translated into some sort of secular Esperanto and lose its cutting edge. And not that it's just religious people who need to hide their working when entering the public square. As Jonathan Chaplin writes in a stimulating new monograph, secular reasons are no more or less tribal than religious ones, and grounded just as much in hidden contestable assumptions, such as the moral autonomy of the rational individual or the sovereign will of the people. All of which makes very timely Vallely's assertion that we need a new public discourse one which allows space for all engaged in the public square to articulate the deeper convictions underlying their language. 
As Stephen Heap has put it, this would result in a level of public discourse in which, quote, truth and truth claims are dealt with without ridicule, but with deep acknowledgement that we disagree, at times profoundly so, and yet somehow have to survive together on the same plot of land. Creating such properly secular spaces, Heap concludes, is a major challenge to which we must rise if our conflicting allegiances are not to tear us apart. Of course, the purpose of confessional candour must not be simply to enable all to parade their deepest convictions for its own sake. The point is to add to the quality of public debate, to contribute more effectively to the welfare of the city. So let me end with an example of how a new type of conversation might benefit us here in New Zealand, taking as a case study one which I plan to develop in the winter lectures I've been invited to give in Auckland and Wellington later this year on behalf of the university. Almost everyone agrees that the size of our prison population is too high and rising too fast. While the rate of reported crime actually fell between 2004 and 2008, the rate of imprisonment over that same period rose by more than 20%. In cost terms alone, this is worrying. The Department of Corrections saw a real increase in its spending over that period of 64%, and it currently costs around $250 per day to keep someone in prison. But the trends at work here and our apparent concern more with treating symptoms than causes suggest the need for a very serious and wide-ranging debate. The sort of debate we need, however, will not take place while the issue of crime and punishment remains a hot political potato, while policy is made less on the basis of evidence than in response to popular perceptions about the situation. The absence of space for informed public debate to which I alluded earlier does not help. And while the media can hardly be blamed for wanting to attract audiences by giving full coverage to major crime stories, the fact that a similar amount of time and space is not accorded to seriously debating the underlying issues and most comment reduced to 15 second sound bites clearly is unhelpful. Were this issue to be taken out of the political arena, as has happened in, for example, Finland, a debate informed by confessional candour might be possible. Away from the glare of the media and without the temptation to place popularity above conviction, a spirit of genuine openness could prevail, with beliefs and philosophies shared and a consensus to meet agreed targets reached. This approach is hardly original. We already have a political consensus around, for example, our non-nuclear stance, funding for superannuation, the importance of the treaty. And there would appear to be much merit in extending it to an issue like the one I have suggested. I do not suggest for a moment that any of this would be easy, either getting agreement for a bipartisan approach or finding any sort of consensus once it happened. These issues are complex. For example, rates of serious crime are increasing at alarming levels and tough measures are clearly necessary in many cases. But at the other end of the scale, the suitability of prison in the case of other crimes needs to be considered in the light of evidence, as does our very high rate of recidivism and the potentiality of a restorative approach to help people make a fresh start after release. But the difficulties involved in finding a solution to this should not prevent us trying and theology, which would have much to say on all these issues, should be among the voices drowning out those counselling despair and call instead for vision. If theology is about anything, it's about hope and faith, which the writer of the Hebrews calls the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Or as Jim Wallace puts it, believing despite the evidence and then watching the evidence change. In fact, if there's one sentence that sums up what public theology aspires to be, that is probably it. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My task is to thank Professor Bradstock for his lecture. 
a task to which I will shortly turn. But let me, on behalf of the Department of Theology and Religion, also add my thanks to you for your attendance today and for your interest in the notion and in the practice of public theology. It is, of course, hard to do public theology without a public to engage with, so your presence is rather important. In one of the public conversations hosted by the centre to which Andrew has referred, our Deputy Prime Minister, the Honourable Bill English, was asked about how his own Christian faith shaped his political life. Bill English replied that his Catholic upbringing had alerted him to the deep wells of wisdom that are available in the biblical tradition. He argued that that wisdom has a great deal to offer in today's social and political environment. Andrew has sketched for us some of the central strands of that wisdom, a wisdom that in spite of its ancient pedigree has a remarkable freshness in today's society. Is it because it is a wisdom we have forgotten and so to be reminded is to hear it as if for the first time? Long, long ago, prophets of Israel told us that the measure of a good society was how well it cared for the vulnerable in its midst, the widow, for instance, the orphan and the foreigner. It would seem novel now to apply that wisdom to our political arena, to test the policies of our social and political life against that measure, and to seek new policies if the ones we are following now leave the vulnerable still suffering. It would seem novel now to speak of forgiveness in the realm of national and of international affairs. It would seem novel to act as Jesus' parable of the workers in the vineyard commends and pay labourers according to their need rather than according to their just deserts. These biblical notions seem novel even in the so-called Christian West, perhaps because Christian theology has not been public enough. Andrew has pointed out that the task of theology, the task of attentiveness to a word and a wisdom that we ourselves receive as gift, is public by nature. No theology worthy of its name can be concerned with any, anything less than the whole of God's creation. All of us in the department and elsewhere who engage in the discipline of theology are thus public theologians in the sense that Andrew has described. Yet Andrew has been charged with establishing a centre that has as its primary goal the public consideration of theology's claims. Andrew, you have begun that task very well. Tonight you have given us a sense of the richness, the depth and the scope of the task. We thank you for that and we wish you well as you continue to build the centre and develop the discipline of contributing constructively to contemporary discourse in the public square, drawing upon the insights of faith. If, as you hope, a better conversation is generated in New Zealand society, we look forward to watching the evidence change. Andrew, we have a gift for you uh, on behalf of the university to commemorate this occasion. And as I present it to me, please join me in thanking Andrew once more.